So I've heard you want to get into astrophotography. Well, let me tell you, it is going to wind up being lots of no sleep nights for you and your bank account is going to be run dry. But if you're really interested, let's get going on some of the fundamental things that you need to know before you take your first serious astrophotos. As always, thank you so much for joining me yet again. In this video, we're going to be talking about a few things that astrophotographers have mastered over the years to be able to produce some of the photos that we produce. Now, I am by no means a professional, and the equipment that I have is just what I can afford, but that doesn't take away from the fact that I can still take some really beautiful photos, at least in my opinion. But there are a few things, though, that even when I was starting out that I would have loved to have known than having to do countless hours of research and trial and errors in order to figure out certain problems I came across. The number one thing we need, obviously, is clear darkness. Now, regardless if you live in a light-polluted city or not, this isn't really going to change a whole lot because we do have different cameras and filters in today's world that can alleviate the light pollution issue for us. Now, it's not a, you know fix all these light pollution filters, but they certainly do about 80% of the work for us. And that is just so much of a help compared to what we were just simply 10 years ago. Now, if you're lucky enough to live in a place or have a cabin or something like that, where, you know, you have really dark sky, kudos to you because we, some of us are not that fortunate. But there are a few things aside from just having a night sky, a clear night sky, that really matter to us. And the first thing I want to touch on is aperture. Aperture means the diameter of the front of your objective up here, whether it be your camera lens like this is, whether it be your telescope or pair of binoculars or whatever it is that you're taking a photo through. The aperture is the diameter of the front piece of either the glass or the primary mirror, if you're using a telescope like a reflector, that has mirrors instead of lenses. Think about aperture in the sense of the bigger the telescope, the more light gathering power you've got versus your eyes. And so the camera is already so much more sensitive than your eyes. So a larger aperture telescope is going to do nothing but bring in hundreds of times of more light than your eyes can, even thousands of times, depending on how big of a telescope you get. And even though the saying is the bigger the better, sometimes that's not always the best, of course, if you're trying to haul this rig out to a campsite, or if you're, you know, you don't have a front yard that you can set up and you've got to go to the local community park every night to set up or something like that, just keep that in mind. So you want something that's going to be a little bit more portable and on the lightweight end of the spectrum. Now, if you do have like a backyard observatory and you can put, you know, a nice 12 inch back there, then by all means go for it. Because of course, the more aperture, the more light you're going to gather for that camera sensor. So that's always a good thing. The second thing I want to talk about is focal length. Now, focal length is basically just the length that the light has to travel in your specific optical tube. This distance, this is only 135 millimeters, which gives us our focal length. So telescopes all have a focal length. Now, whether or not they're a refractor, they go straight through the lenses right back to the eyepiece. Whether it's a something like a Cassegrain where it's folded a couple of times, typically those will have a longer focal length. But basically how to think about focal length is the lower the number of the focal length. So we're going to take this, for example, because it's 135, the more wider, the more zoomed out in a way your photo is going to be. If you have a higher focal length, something like, you know, a thousand millimeters versus this, your photo is literally going to be 10 times more narrow or zoomed in. So that's something to take note of when you're picking a telescope is some of the targets that you may want to take a photo of require certain focal lengths to get wide enough to get that whole target on the sensor chip. The third thing I want to talk about is the focal ratio. Now the focal ratio basically means how your camera will respond to your specific telescope. In the sense of if you have a camera lens, and if you've ever seen a camera lens like this one, where you can stop down the aperture and you notice the light cone basically goes in and out. That's something very similar on telescopes, except it's a fixed number. 
but it works very similar ways. How you get that is you divide the focal length by your aperture. So this one, for example, would be the 135 divided by 70 or whatever your aperture is. So like my telescope inside, my Celestron 5-inch Maxitov, that has a 1500 millimeter focal length. If we divide it by 127 millimeters, which is our aperture, we get f12 for that telescope. The lower the focal ratio, the more light gathering every second you're going to get. Now, this configuration is different on every single telescope, and some telescopes like SCTs are always usually at about f10, and refractors are normally between f5 to f7 usually for most refractors. Reflectors tend to be a lot wider field, so they have a focal length that's a little bit lower and also an f ratio that's a little bit lower they tend to get down to about f4 to f5 and then if you have a hyperstar on your celestron schmidt cassegrain where you take your eight inch or nine and a quarter or 11 inch f10 and turn it in to an eight inch f2 like i have now those are really quite fantastic because that optical accessory is taking your focal ratio and just flipping it to the other end of the spectrum from f10 down to f2. Now that yields us a much wider field, but it also really lets a lot of light into our camera. However, most people typically shoot between f4 to f6, and that's a really good range because at f2 you can have some issues with filters, you can have some issues with the how big the stars get, you can have some other things. Even though it sounds appealing to have f2, it's not always the absolute best for certain applications. f4 to f6 is a really, really good choice. That's basically middle of the ground, you're going to get the maximum sharpness and clarity out of most of the deep sky targets that you take a photo of. Now the next thing I want to talk about is stacking. Now a lot of people, including myself in the beginning, I used to take a single photo and go, oh my gosh, there's Orion. You know, it looks great. It had color. It looked better than what it did through the eyepiece. And I thought, that's incredible. But I wanted to figure out how to take the photo from my original photo and turn it into something like I did this year where it's absolutely incredible looking. And the answer to that is, is after you get familiar with all this, you're gonna have to have a lot of patience. You're gonna have to do a thing called stacking. And that means basically you're taking the same exact photo. Instead of once, you're gonna take it 100 times, 200 times, 300 times, as many times as you want. Put in the hours because the more photos you can capture, the more data you can collect, on a single target, the better and better and better and better that photo is going to be. The more color you're going to get, the more detail you're going to get. Now, this is obviously a big patience thing, and I myself like instant gratification. So if you're like me, I feel your pain because, boy, is it hard to train yourself to have to go through hours and hours of the same thing. But believe me, at the end, it is all worth it. So after you stack them all together using Deep Sky Stacker, or if you have an ASI camera, you can use ASI Studio or Pixel Processor, whichever you want to use for your stacking software algorithms are more than sufficient, but you will definitely yield much, much, much better results. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, auto-guiding. Auto-guiding is something that basically it's just like this. We have the main optical assembly here. This is just one of my camera lenses, but this little scope up here with the little baby camera sticking out the back, this is what we call an auto guider. And this is basically a small rifle scope, if you'd have it, and with a camera attached to the back. And all that it's doing is it monitors a star in the star field, and you will tell it to track on that star, and it will make micro corrections for your specific telescope mount. And what that does is it keeps the target perfectly centered during your long exposure photos. So if you're taking two minute exposures, let's say, that micro tracking will keep the star precision within a certain range of tolerance, which will keep your photo perfectly still so your stars don't get trailed or get all blurry on you. Auto guiding is very, very important anything over really about 300 millimeters in focal length, you probably should start auto guiding. And only simply because it's going to help you take those photos from 30 seconds up to a minute, up to two minutes, up to five minutes sometimes if you get a good polar alignment. But auto guiding is the answer. 
Auto guiders are relatively inexpensive. They are quite necessary though. And if you have something like the ASI Air Pro like this, you can integrate everything together and let it do its auto guiding and its photo capturing all together. As always, thank you so much for joining me and I'll be sure to make another video in the near future on the next steps after you've learned these couple of things about astrophotography. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great rest of your night and clear skies.